Mark uh, for leading us in worship. Um, Join me one more moment in prayer as we prepare our hearts uh, for the word of God. Heavenly Father, we come to you now uh, eager to hear a word from you. Father, we pray that that is what happens now. As we open up your word, may we hear from you. May nothing keep us from hearing from you. Father, may I not get in the way of you speaking to your people. We've gathered here. May we have the ears and hearts to receive your word. And we pray these things, not in just any name. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Uh, The February uh, 1998 edition of Reader's Digest uh, tells one of my favorite stories, and then one of my favorite stories from Reader's Digest flows right into one of my favorite stories that actually comes from another preacher. Uh, But February 1998, this edition of Reader's Digest tells a story of a couple uh, who took early retirement. He was 59 and she was 51. Took early retirement so they could move to Florida and spend their time cruising around on their 30-foot fishing boat, playing softball and collecting shells. It's one of my favorite stories because it then leads to a a pastor remarking on this uh, in a a, a powerful way. The pastor read this story and and originally thought it was a spoof. He thought it was satire uh, on the American dream. But it wasn't. There's two people. Retired early, 59 and 51, so they could spend time cruising around, playing softball, and collecting shells. This particular pastor read this story and said, well, what a tragedy. He said, imagine this couple standing before Christ on the great day of judgment with nothing but offering up to God. But look, look at my shells. What a tragedy that we would devote our lives for nothing. That we would devote our lives in pursuit of what we might call the American dream. Retiring early in collecting shells. I find money um, to be a funny thing. Um, it's a funny thing because in, in many ways, well, money, resources, can allow you to, partip- to participate in a lot of good things. In our area of life, money, resources, can actually allow you to participate in a lot of things of God. But when you really open up Scripture, you can also see how money can keep you from participating in the things of God. And it's always dangerous when, when preachers start talking about money. And I, I promise you, I don't do it because it's at the top of my list of things to talk about. We're walking through the book of Ecclesiastes. And we're, we're not going through every verse, but we're walking through it. And I'm pay, picking up large themes that get hit upon over and over and over. And the preacher... Uh, The teacher from Ecclesiastes says a lot of things about money because in his attempt to find fulfillment, um, he found lots of money. And he found that it didn't fulfill him at all. So join me 
Ecclesiastes chapter 5. And we'll pick it up at verse 8, and we'll read to the end of the chapter. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verses 8 through 20. And I read these verses, this passage, and I think it's a story of riches to rags. You know, we typically talk about rags to riches stories. We like somebody that started at the bottom and became successful, started at the bottom and made lots of money. And the preacher would say, well, that's not what it's cracked up to be. Riches to rags. If you've got Ecclesiastes chapter 5 open, can I hear a big loud amen? amen? The preacher tells us, Ecclesiastes chapter 5 verse 8, if you see the poor oppressed in a district, and justice and rights denied. Do not be surprised at such things, for one official is eyed by a higher one, and over them both are others higher still. The increase from the land is taken by all. The king himself profits from the fields. Whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. This too is meaningless. As goods increase, so do those who consume them. And what benefit are they to the owners except to feast their eyes on them? The sleep of a laborer is sweet, whether they eat little or much, but as for the rich, their abundance permits them no sleep. Verse 13, I have seen a grievous evil under the sun, wealth hoarded to the harm of its owners, or wealth lost through some misfortune, so that when they have children, there is nothing left for them to inherit. Everyone comes naked from their mother's womb, and as everyone comes, so they depart. They take nothing from their toil that they can carry in their hands. Verse 16, this too is a grievous evil. As everyone comes, so they depart, and what do they gain since they toil for the wind? All their days they eat in darkness with great frustration, affliction, and anger. Verses 18 through 20, the preacher tries to wrap this up, conclude it a bit. He says, this is what I have observed to be good. That is appropriate for a person. That it is appropriate for a person to eat, to drink, to find satisfaction in their toilsome labor under the sun during the few days of life God has given them, for this is their lot. Moreover, when God gives someone wealth and possessions and the ability to enjoy them, to accept their lot and to be happy in their toil, this is a gift of God. They seldom reflect on the days of their life because God keeps them occupied with gladness of heart. Again, I realize there's a lot there, and uh, the preacher has this tendency to grab a hold of an idea and describe it in every way imaginable, to come at it from these various angles, and to, to use a lot of flowery and poetic images. But even in this passage, where we are charting new ground, he's uh, scratched uh, the, the surface of a new topic for us, but he has also relived some places that we have already been. Uh, we began our study uh, with the idea of everything being meaningless. We see it again here. He throws here wealth, riches. It's meaningless. I do want to remind you that we have meaningless in our English translations. You might have futile or vanity. Um, this word we commonly translate meaningless. It's the Hebrew word hevel used 38 times across the 12 chapters of Ecclesiastes. 
meaningless, futile, vanity, all appropriate translations. But the word does have a bit of depth, a little bit more depth than that. Um, on, on one hand, it can mean that, indeed, life is quick. It's here, and then it's gone. It goes by in a flash. It's a, it's a vapor. It, it has that meaning. And then, and then it also has this uh, other meaning of life is full of paradoxes. Meaning, there, there's lots of good in the world, but also lots of tragedy. And a lot of times we think something good should happen and then something bad should happen. And then something bad happens. Or sometimes we think something bad should happen and then good things happen. Or we think uh, bad things should happen for that person and then good things happen to them. And then we look at someone else and we think bad things should happen to that person and then good things happen to them. We, we just don't know what's going to happen. Everything is it's meaningless. It's futile. It's vanity. It's this Hebrew word, hevel. We, we even see that bit. Of course, he uses the word here. But we see that paradox understanding in the passage that we just read moments ago. In 18 through 20, our, our melancholy preacher actually ends on a high note. This is a bit new for us, of the passages that we've looked at on Wednesday night. He's been pretty glum so far. But at the end of chapter 5, he's actually got a bit of a high note. He goes, hey, this is what we should actually do. We, we should actually find satisfaction in these gifts of God. Like If, if you have some things, you, you should be happy for them because God's given them to you. If, if, if you only read that verse, you would go, oh, this this." That's nice, we can, we can work on that. But if you were to keep reading, for instance, we stopped at the end of five, but if you kept reading into six, he says, I, I have seen another evil under the sun, and it weighs heavily on mankind. God gives some people wealth, possessions, and honor, so they lack nothing their hearts desire. But God does not grant them the ability to enjoy them, and strangers enjoy them instead. This is meaningless, a grievous evil. Paradox, right? You think he's happy at the end of five, and then right at the beginning of six. All we should do is find satisfaction in our stuff. But then some people, God just doesn't let find satisfaction. They're just never going to be happy. It's hevel. Life is futile. It's here. It's gone. And then it's filled with things that we don't understand. So we're building on this theme, hevel. Preacher's already shown us everything's meaningless. The preacher has also shown us in previous weeks that a lot of things that we occupy our time with in life is chasing after the wind. It's chasing after the wind because it, it fills our days up. We grow exhausted, but we have nothing to show for it. We're tired but not fulfilled. And here again, riches, it's meaningless. And riches, wealth, is a chasing after the wind as well. We work and we work and we work and we work and we're just never satisfied. Tired, we go to bed tired with nothing to show for it. And here we, we get a concrete example of those things in the passage we read tonight. Those themes have been introduced. We've discussed them at length already, but now he gives us a case study of it. There's a man who's devoted time, effort to accumulating riches. But it didn't fulfill him didn't fill the hole. If you've been here in previous weeks, uh, perhaps you remember uh, the Blaise Pascal quote that we dumb down and paraphrase into that we, we all have this vacuum in our heart that can only be filled by God. That fits in here too. 
The preacher's trying to say, I got that hole and I've tried to fill it with riches, but it didn't work. If you've been here in previous weeks, I have brought into this, this quote from Tom Brady in the 60 Minutes interview. And this is after he's made the millions of dollars and he's won multiple Super Bowls and he's won multiple MVPs and he's married the supermodel. And he looks at the interviewer and he says, there's got to be something more than this. There's got to be something more than this. And he's asked the question, well, what could that be? I wish I knew. Hevel, chasing after the wind. And now that we've understood those concepts, the, the preacher's now given us a concrete example of an attempt to gain money, wealth, riches. I think we take that passage we just read a moment ago. I think verses 10 and 15 summarize it for us. Verse 10 says, Whoever... Loves money, never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. This, is, too, is meaningless. I think we know that to be true. I think because that's so true to real life, even the person that doesn't attend Wednesday night Bible study knows the truth of that statement. No matter how much we earn, we spend it all. And no matter how much we earn, we always want more. And no matter how much we earn, we always look at the neighbor with the nicer house and the nicer car and said, I wish I had that. And then once you get it, you just look to the opposite neighbor or the person across the street. Or you move into a nicer neighborhood. Now your nicer neighborhood, the person next to you has a nicer house and a nicer car. No matter how much you earn, no matter how many pay raises, you spend it all and you always want more. I think we know that to be true. Verse 15 helps us summarize all of this. Everyone comes naked from their mother's womb, and as everyone comes, so they depart. They take nothing from their toil that they can carry in their hands. You can take both of those passages of Scripture and we put it into today's language, today's vernacular. You, you can't take it with you. You can't. The, the, the old preacher joke, right? You don't see the funeral car pull in a U-Haul. You, you can't take it with you. You can earn a lot of stuff. You can make a lot of money here on earth, and it's never going to satisfy you. And then the day you die, you leave it here. And as we've seen in a previous place in Ecclesiastes, he gets really upset when he thinks about the fact that he worked so hard for this stuff. And then when he dies, he has to give it to his kids. And that's not fair. Hevel. Right? They don't deserve all this stuff. I think in modern day language, we'd say you can't take it with you. I also think the preacher's also taking a jab at our modern day notion of the one who dies with the most toys wins. No, it doesn't work like that either. He says this accumulation of stuff, wealth, riches, it's hevel. But as I said, moments ago, money is a funny thing. Um, because with money, you can participate in a lot of things of God, but at the same time, money can keep you from a lot of things of God. People often misquote 1 Timothy 6.10. It often gets misquoted as money is the root of all evil. It's actually a misquote. Uh, 1 Timothy 6.10 says the, the love of money is the root of all evil. Not money in and of itself. It's, it's how we see, how we use 
how we pursue money. That full quote, 1 Timothy 6.10 says, Money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. I find that powerful. The preacher in Ecclesiastes 5 speaks about grievous evils. 1 Timothy 6.10 says this love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And, and with this pursuit and eagerness to have money, people have pierced themselves with all sorts of grief. Money in and of itself is not evil. The pursuit of money, this love of money, perhaps that's the road that needs to be explored a bit more. Because money, it... Um, Money funds cancer research. Um, money funds research for f fun things like iPhones and sending rockets up into space. Uh, uh, money sends Baptist missionaries uh, around the world. Um, money, of, uh, of course, empowered by the Holy Spirit, but money funds the ministry of this church. So hopefully that's got some gears turning. We're going to go to this portion of our Wednesday night Bible study a little earlier than we have uh, in previous weeks because Jesus loves to talk about money and he at least loves to bring money to the forefront. So we're going to bring Jesus into this conversation a little earlier because we're going to look at two Jesus stories tonight. If you have been here in previous weeks... Um, we're studying Ecclesiastes. It's an honest look at life. Right? Some people love the book of Ecclesiastes. Uh, some people could leave it at home. Uh, whether you feel like you love it or, or you hate it, you have to admit it's an honest look at life. The preacher has experienced things, and in the 12 chapters, he's giving us hard lessons learned, and he doesn't care how we feel about it. He says, here's what I've experienced, here's what I've learned. And in our walk through these 12 chapters, we're reading Ecclesiastes. We're trying to grab a hold of it, get a handle on it. And then we want to bring Jesus into the study. As I've been saying, we want Jesus standing over my shoulder as we read the book. So, preacher tells us money is... Hevel. Money can be a, a chasing after the wind. I've brought up this concept that money is a funny thing. It can al allow us to participate in the things of God, but at the same time it also can prevent us from the things of God. Let's turn to a couple of Jesus stories that allow Jesus to enter this conversation with us. If you would turn to Mark chapter 10... Pick it up at verse 17. Mark 10, 17. If you're still with me, can I hear an amen? We're going to walk through this for a moment. Uh, Mark 10, uh, verse 17. We're just going to take a section of this passage. We'll read from 17 through 22. Um, and I want us to read this, and, and as we read this, I, I also want, want to um, encourage you in a certain way. I get a lot of questions about how I go about reading Scripture. Uh, people ask me this question a lot, and um, my, my answer is always boring, um, but I want to walk you through it a bit. Uh, the Gospels in particular, um, my answer's boring, but the Scriptures aren't boring. Um, I think we just read them in boring ways. We, we read the passage of Scripture uh, the same way we might read a tweet or a Facebook post or the same way we might read a text message from our spouse or our grandkids. We read them flatly, like they're all trying to communicate the same things. 
You take a passage of Scripture, and here's somebody, as we're about to see, somebody like you and me coming face-to-face with Jesus and asking a question. I'm not going to read that the same way uh, I read a social media post, right? Here's somebody who was face-to-face with God the Son and got to ask him a question. What does he ask? What does Jesus say back to him? Perhaps I've had that same question. Perhaps I've wondered that same thing. Perhaps he's about to ask that one thing I always say, oh, as soon as I get to heaven, I'm going to ask God this. Well, what if he's about to ask that question? And I could know the answer right now. I digress. Mark chapter 10, 17 through 22 so let's walk through this. Let's Mark 10, 17, as Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. We're going to do this really slow, but I promise you I won't keep you here all night. We got to this part early so we could walk through this slowly, right? If you were reading at home or if you were reading this like a text message, you might be real, okay, that's not the good stuff of this story. Let's get past it. But think about this. Jesus is on his way somewhere, and a man runs to him, falls on his knees. If I was reading at this in, in my house, and this is not just preacher theatrics, right? I don't want to get that imagery in my brain. Jesus is on his way somewhere. And he's approached by a man who runs to him, falls on his knees. I want that imagery in my mind. I want to see Jesus looking like he's determined to go somewhere. He's got a schedule to keep, a place to be, a a miracle to perform. And he's interrupted by a man, runs to him, panting, falls on his knees. I picture the dust coming up. Well, what's he going to say? Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? That's a good question. One I've pondered. Right? There's things that I want, things that I want somebody to give to me. Eternal life would be high up on the list. Why is this guy called Jesus good? That's bouncing around in my brain. Oh, read verse 18. That's exactly what Jesus asks him. Why do you call me good, Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. Now, a lot of people have wondered about this. I've wondered about this. I've done my fair share of study and praying and reading and researching. Here's my take on this. I'll save you the time. I think Jesus is playing a bit of a a game with the man. Are you claiming that I'm good? You just said I was good. Did you mean that? And the guy goes, well, of course I mean that. I called you good. I'm a man of my word. I called you good. And Jesus says, now, the only person that is good is God. Now, if you claim I'm good, you're claiming I'm God. You're asking me about eternal life because you think I know the answer. You're asking me about eternal life because there's somewhere in the back of your brain that you think I'm God. And now that we've got our cards out on the table, if you call me good, you think I'm God, and you've asked me a question about eternal life, now whatever I tell you, you will have to believe because God tells it to you, or you will have to hear it and reject what God told you, or flip-flop on whether I'm God or not. (laughs) Those are your options. I'm about to answer your question, and you're going to have to believe it or deny God, Uh, or you could not believe it, and just go back on the very thing you just said. Why do you call me good? Jesus answered, no one is good except God alone. He says, you know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and your mother. 
Jesus pulling some of the commandments out. Verse 20, teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Again, if we were reading this like a social media post or a text message, we realize that there's still some more story to go and, and we don't take much stock in what was just said. But just think about this for a moment. This guy has just made the claim that Jesus is God. Jesus told him you need to obey the commandments. And this man's reaction is, I've done all that. I've done that since I was a little boy. I'm sitting there reading that, and I go, well, how's Jesus going to react to that? Jesus going to give him a pass on that? Jesus looked at him and loved him. Isn't that an interesting detail? Jesus looked at this man claiming that he kept the commandments since he was a boy. And Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said. Is Jesus going to let him get a pass on keeping all the commandments? <laughs> Jesus going to let that one slide. Okay. Jesus looked at him and loved him. I, I appreciate what you're saying here. I don't quite think you mean all that you think you mean. Jesus said, one thing you lack. Go sell everything you have and give to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven. Then, come follow me. So what's Jesus getting at here? So you're not following me now. You've just run up to me, collapsed at my feet and asked me a question about inheriting eternal life. I'm going to ask you to do one thing. Bless people with your stuff and then come follow me. Verse 22, at this, the man's face fell, and he went away sad because he had great wealth. <laughs> Jesus said, why, why, why do you call me good? If you called me good... You're really claiming that I'm God. And if you're claiming that I'm God, whatever I tell you next, you must obey. Because it's not coming from a man. It's not merely coming from a good teacher. It's coming from God. So the one thing you lack is uh, you've got a really tight grip on your stuff. <laughs> your stuff, your riches, your treasure is actually keeping you from following God. So Jesus, I'm not asking you a million things. I'm asking you to do one thing. Let, let go of the thing which has gripped you. Fascinating. In verse 22, at this the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Think about this. Here's a guy looking Jesus Straight in the eye. He is, he's face to face with God the Son. And he contemplates his wealth. And he contemplates following Jesus. And he chooses wealth. He, he contemplates the power of his wealth. And he contemplates the power of God. And he chooses wealth wealth really easy when we read stories like this this is another way I like to read the scriptures it's really easy from this side of the page to look down on this poor chap 
How could he do that? How could he be so foolish? But have you ever heard a call from God? Contemplated this call and decided on disobedience? Imagine if a... (laughs) There just happened to be a gospel writer around the corner as you were hearing from God and contemplating disobedience or obedience and choosing disobedience. This this is not some poor chap. This is the very people in the room. In this instance, this ruler um, found the power of wealth more appealing than the power of God. Wealth kept him from participating in the things of God. But that's not the only story that Jesus gives us. He he tends to talk about this subject a, a lot. One of my favorite stories along these lines uh, comes from Mark chapter 12. If you could make a couple page flips over. Um, this is a similar story, uh, but from the opp- opposite perspective. You could turn to Mark chapter 12, verse 41. Mark chapter 12, verse 41. You're still with me. Can I hear a big, loud amen? Amen. Mark 12, verse 41. So Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large Amount. So again, here this is where I stop, and I like to get this in my mind's eye. You've got Jesus uh, apart, uh, separate, opposite, near the place where they're collecting money. And you've got rich folks coming in, and they're taking what would have been coins, and lots of them and placing them into some sort of jar or pot. This would have been a showy endeavor. And this would have been a noisy endeavor. How are they getting these coins out? Are they carrying them in a pouch? Hard to conceal a large pouch of coins. Are they dumping the whole pouch into the jar? Or are they sticking their hand in there and pulling out coins and placing them in there? I mean, you do this, you're, 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 you're showing a whole handful of coins. You're also showing that you've got a lot of these coins, right? There's still some in the, in the bag. Are you doing it this way? Are you you're putting the coins into the jar and they're pinging and panging their way all the way to the bottom. Um, this, this wasn't completely widespread, but it was fairly popular in Baptist life. They, they, they used to promote these Sundays called Noisy Sundays where they would try to get kids to participate in the offering so they would get kids uh, to bring in their coins to church. And you would have this same effect, right? The offering plates going by and then here's this kid throwing in every coin they found in every sofa around the house gets kids participating in worship but it's called noisy Sunday because this wasn't a quiet or peaceful experience a lot of coins rattling here's that scenario here in Mark chapter 12 Jesus is standing across and he's watching these people walk in in a dramatic show of placing lots of coins into the temple treasury. Then verse 42. But a 
poor widow, Jesus means that literally, a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a few cents. Okay, Mark loves to do this. Um, uh, the stories that Mark includes in his gospel, he uh, loves these contrast stories. So if you've got in your mind's eye, Jesus across from the temple treasury, people are walking in, they're even dumping whole bags of coins, or they're reaching in bags, and the coins are pinging and panging, and it's big and loud and noisy. And here comes a poor widow. It would have been visibly noticeable that she was from a different social class, economic class, would have been seen in her dress, would have been known by her reputation. She comes in and she puts two small coins. Not loud, not flashy, two small coins. What's Jesus going to do with this? Verse 33, calling his disciples to him. Jesus said, truly I tell you, this poor widow has put more money into the treasury than all the others. You'd have to ask, well, how's that? Theirs was big, loud, noisy, flashy. Hers were just two small coins. Verse 44, they all gave out of their wealth. But she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all she had to live on. So money, or or the lack thereof, could not... (laughs) Keep this poor widow from participating in the work of God. She gets noticed because she actually does the Jesus-like thing. She actually did something that required sacrifice. There's an interesting thing happening in the, uh, this verse 44. I read it moments ago. They all gave out of their wealth, uh, but she gave out of her poverty. But, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all she had to live on. Uh, We add those last few words in our English translations in an attempt uh, to make sense of what just happened in light of the context. She gave everything that she had to live on. Uh, The actual original Greek there, uh, she gave her bios, she gave her life, period. She gave her life. We, 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 we try to make it fit the context. She gave all she had to live on. We try to make it solely about money. But I like the plainer reading of the text. She gave her life. She had a life devoted to God. Again, it's dangerous for... Uh, a preacher to be speaking about money, but it's that last point that I'm really lifting up. Uh, it's not about money. It's uh, about devotion. To whom or to what have we devoted our life? The preacher says, you can devote your life to money, but it's hevel 
It's futile. It's meaningless. It's vanity. He says you could devote your life to, to money, to, to wealth, to accumulating stuff, but it's a chasing after the wind. It's going to make you tired. It's going to keep you up at night. It's going to wake you up in the morning, but it won't leave you fulfilled. Jesus, in the story of the young ruler, says, it's not going to leave you fulfilled, but it sure can keep you from things. It may not fill that hole in your heart, but it sure can grab a hold of your heart. And then Jesus, in this little lesson after the poor widow, says, you could have nothing. And still be devoted to God. Here's three perspectives. Here's three voices. Here here are three stories. Dishing out hard learned lessons on the pursuit of wealth. Which one resonates? Um, Does money keep you from participating in the things of God? Or does money allow you to participate in the things of God? Maybe a more direct question. Um, Have you ever said no to God because you thought the sacrifice was too great? I think that's a better question because it, it, it takes it out of the realm of money, which makes us all uncomfortable. <laughs> Sacrifice, it, it shouldn't make us any more comfortable. But for some reason, it's more socially acceptable to talk about. Have you ever said no to God because you thought the sacrifice was too great? Or on the other hand, have you ever said no to God because you didn't think you had enough to give? I think there's both people in the room tonight. I think there may be some of us who are both people at the same time. Ultimately, it comes down to a matter of devotion. Jesus asked the the young ruler, come follow me. Because that's what I'm after. I'm wanting you to put the old life behind and I'm asking you to come follow me. We tend to hear these passages of scripture and, and we picture Jesus saying them to a whole group. I love these gospel stories because Jesus is not standing up many times as a preacher to a large crowd. He's talking to this individual man that ran up to him and dropped at his feet. Jesus is looking at one particular individual and he's saying, put that old life behind. Let let all that other stuff go and come follow me. There's one individual that said, I'd rather not. I'd rather walk away sad and keep a hold of what has truly gripped my life. I, I'd, I'd, I'm acknowledging to you that my life is not going to be devoted to you. My life is going to be con, is going to continue to be devoted to my stuff. And then on the other hand, you have this poor widow who had nothing, but she's devoted. She's all in. She has given her life. Have you said no to God because you thought the sacrifice was too great? Or have you ever said no to God because you thought you didn't have much to give? I pose the question. And and I'm convinced uh, that the Spirit can bring the answer to those questions to the surface of your heart. 
once the answer to those questions have risen to the surface, will you follow Jesus or walk away sad? May we be the ones who give our lives. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I am thankful for the people gathered in this room. And I'm thankful to the people tuned into this broadcast. I know, as you say in your word and the story we read tonight, you look at each one of us tonight and you love us. May that provide us comfort this evening, that you look at all of us, no matter where we've been, no matter what we've done, no, what, no matter what we're doing at this very moment, you look at us and you love us because you created us. And as your word says, you've demonstrated your love for us on the cross where you died for us. And Father, I pray that every person hearing my voice, that we would gladly accept your invitation to come follow you. As we contemplate the things that, I, that have gripped our heart, that we would release our fingers, that we would let those things go, and we would follow after you. If we did that yesterday, may we do it again tomorrow. And may we do it the day after that and the day after and the day after. May we seek after you. May we follow after you because you are the one who does provide eternal life. Father, we lift up our church tonight. There's many within our church uh, in need tonight. Uh, we've got people in hospitals. Uh, we've got people recently out of hospitals. We have people headed into hospitals. And Father, you call on us as the church to pray for those who are sick. We intercede on their behalf. And we ask in your grace, in your mercy, in your power, that you would heal. Because we know that you can so we fall at your feet and we intercede and we ask that you, can, that you, you would because we know that you can. And Father, we lift up uh, those uh, reeling and suffering affected from the recent storms um, in Louisiana and beyond uh, all the way up to New York and New Jersey. Uh, Father, we pray that people of faith would stand up and act as people of faith um, groups like the Texas Baptist men would be able to go in and do the work that you've called and gifted them to do. Uh, Father, we pray for things to be restored and homes to be repaired. And we also pray that the gospel would be preached. And Father, as always, we, we, we lift up our country to you. We, we pray for leaders from... Uh, local courthouses uh, all the way up to the White House. We, we pray for churches on every corner to be the church. We, we pray for those in leadership positions, again, from the courthouse to the White House, that they would make God-honoring decisions, that you would surround those leaders with people of faith, uh, people that would provide wisdom and, and godly counsel. Um, Father, we pray for our our own households. May, may we seek you before everything. May it start with us, the, the people in this room, people tuned into this broadcast. May, may we seek you first. May we follow after you. And may we be change agents. May we influence our own household and our own block in the neighborhood our own pew in the church house. May you use us. Father, there's so much to pray for. And we realize that we are not God, that you are God and we are not. You are the one with the power and the wisdom. And we bow our lives, we bow our church, uh, we bow our community, uh, we bow our nation before you. 
And we ask for your will to be done. We pray all these things. Um, Thankful that you are with us. We pray that we would walk in step with your spirit. We pray that you would conform us into the image of your son, Jesus. And we pray all these things in his name. Amen.